Hello there. Hope you're enjoying your summer. Beautiful, beautiful weather out, no? What if they're like listening to this in like 2048 and it's the winter? Hope you're enjoying your winter. Yeah. You know, winter's also it's good so in its time. Man. We sat down with an incredible guest this week, Dr. Shauna Friedman, the executive director of Shalom Task Force. For those who don't know yeah. what Shalom Task Force is, it's a bracha if you don't know what it is. You don't want to know what they are. And and But we think it's very important to educate pe- more people to know what it is. You, you could be you've seen like their ads, that the whole purple campaign. But essentially, they are... I, I'm probably butchering what it is, but they're a hotline that people call when they are getting abused, both uh, whether it's it's physical abuse, mental abuse, spiritual any, abuse. There's so really, many things that we delve into. So many types, and and I, I believe it's it's more than just a hotline. It's an entire organization that uh, is filled with therapists, psychologists, doctors that are there to help people who are in these awful situations. And the term abuse is something that is very, I think, broadly defined. And yeah, and Shalom Task Force does an incredible job within the community, but abroad. And Dr. Shalom Fryman is behind all of that. I I myself got a lot of education from this specific episode. Obviously, there's the classics, you know, the stories that we all hear, but I think it's more those events that are more subtle, whether it's it's in a marriage or it's in a workplace that I don't think before this episode I was able to identify. But after having this conversation with Dr. Shana, I mean, we had it a few weeks ago, but right. like after, since then I've literally seen people and I'm like, that is total manipulation. <laughs> that is total abuse. That is not healthy. Like get them out it's of my some, life. Some, you something know? I do want to mention that Shalom Task Force also does is preventative work. You know, right. they do a lot of education within schools and yeshivas. Um, and it should be more yeshivas to, to prevent um, people being abused or being abusers. With a correct, with a proper education, um, these things, you know, hopefully could be prevented. So, if you don't know about them, you can go to their website. You can just Google Shalom Task Force. And, uh, and I, I do have to say though that this episode, uh, should we should we just put out a trigger warning? Maybe we should definitely put out a trigger warning. Yeah. Trigger warning. Trigger warning. If, this, if if these things are get you a little bit worked up this may this episode may not be for you no it's it's a very heavy episode a very heavy episode and we talk about a lot of um a lot of things and yeah we, we i'm glad we figured out there should be a trigger warning yeah yeah we definitely the intro. yeah sorry about that um but also Here's what i want to say <laughs> there the, this conver and we're gonna let you guys listen to it but this conversation although it's sa- like there are a lot of heavy moments but there's also a lot of lighter moments in this and it's definitely I don't say it's a fun episode because it's how about, not. How about they be the judge of okay, that? Okay, but All right. I think you'll enjoy. <laughs> See ya. Welcome to the Meaningful People Podcast. The podcast where we talk to people who are... Meaningful. Yeah, that sounds good. Here we have someone we've we've been working to get for a very long time. Happy to be here. And uh, <laughs> we're so happy to have you on. And we're, we're going to delve into what you do and, and a lot more about Shalom Task Force. I know Nahi and I are both like genuinely just very interested in. Yeah, it's in a very what, interesting topic. Yeah, idea. interesting topic and how they help. But we, I guess, you know, you're on and we want to start off with Dr. Shana. So we're, you're originally not from here, right? I'm not from here. No, I'm originally from Boston and then Baltimore. Boston. Boston. Patriots fan? I am and a Red Sox fan, which don't okay. hold against me. <laughs> <laughs> we no. indoctrinate our children in my family I'm, to I'm do that Mets, as well. I'm a Mets fan, okay. so I was always rooting for the Red Sox. Okay, so I'm going to age myself. I hate the I'm going to age myself, but I remember 86. Oh, really? Very well. It was a traumatic year for us oh. in Boston. Nachi <laughs> yes. and I were in Shemayim. Yes. <laughs> Just looking, Hopefully. Yeah, looking, I don't down. <laughs> looking down. Looking yeah. down. But yes, yeah, so yes, yeah, so originally from Boston, but really much more from Baltimore and graduated the schools of Baltimore based Yaakov and um, lived down there until I moved to New York. Um, a while ago at this point. Did you move to New York for Shalom Task Force? No. Okay. So it's a, I've only been at Shalom Task Force for three years. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. What happened so before that? Before yeah. then. Yeah. Um, so I um, moved to New York shortly after getting my master's in social work from Maryland. And this is, I think it's a great circle, uh, you know, a circle that story that I was graduating from Maryland. I was ready, ready to leave um, Baltimore and I needed a job in New York. So I heard of this place called Shalom Task Force and they were having a conference. I 
I'm a real out of towner and been to Manhattan like twice in my life. <laughs> and I remember they had this conference in downtown Manhattan and I showed up and I handed out a paper resume. 2001, I was handing out a paper resume and I met um, Lisa Tversky and Esther Katz and Esther is from OHEL and she hired me to work in their shelter and I knew nothing about domestic violence. And I worked there for two years and subsequently worked at Met Council and around three years ago, I came on board to Shalom Task Force. So I owe my career to Shalom Task Force, but and I always feel like I've been part of the Shalom Task Force family, but I only started as the executive director um, three years ago. Um, but prior, my work has always been, I'm a social worker, a clinical social worker. I also have a doctorate in social work, and it's all been with victims of domestic violence. Um, and we'll talk about what that means, um, primarily in the from community. I'm really trying to make sure that that services and therapy and treatment is available to them and building services for them that are culturally appropriate and sensitive to all the myriads of needs that from clients will need. So that's how I got to Shalom Task Force. I actually took a year off to go on a sabbatical with my family um, oh, nice. four years ago to Oh, no way. Yes. As I adults, feel like no one we, takes a sabbatical to Puerto Rico. Right. Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we did. We did our, our what do we call it? Shana Roshona. Um, not at Shana Roshona. We went with our children to a year in Israel. That's so nice. That's yeah, so it was cool. incredible. You know, like some people give like Yerusha while they're still alive. <laughs> Couples should do their Shana Roshona like when they have six so, kids. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, so we've cool. been saving this year yeah, for Yeah, it was great. We're, 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 in, we're in Israel. We, we ended up being up north in Zichron Yaakov. I highly recommend it on your next trip. It's okay. like gorgeous and beautiful. And my husband was doing some work up there. And I took some time off from the work and spent time with my family. And That's awesome. Yeah. Is and that then, your end goal to get back to Zichron Yaakov? I think it's Yaakov? all of our end goals. Right, right. That's <laughs> so fair. I yeah. always say, even if it doesn't happen now in our lives, I think we should be Aliyah Jews that we see that as a like a goal to, right. to, to be able to partake in the mitzvah, you should have So, you know, but not happening right now. You, but, but you got, so but after sabbatical, you get back. Right. So I was on sabbatical, but I'd always been really involved in Shalom Task Force's family because um, as you'll learn, we're really volunteer based. And mm -hmm. as a therapist in the community that wasn't, has an expertise in this, they would bring me in to do trainings and I'd be someone they refer clients to. And I always knew a lot of the people involved because I always thought it was a beautiful organization. So when I was over there for the year, they approached me, they said, we're looking for an executive director. When you come back, is this something you'd be interested in? So I started doing some part-time work for them when I was there and then I returned and I was returned and I was blessed to get a job I love, you know, that's, that's, that's like a true I, blessing. Let's just jump right in. Yeah. 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 Go for it. How prevalent is domestic violence in the from world. Okay, so let's take a step back. Okay, let's that. not jump right in. It is jumping yeah. in, but I want to, because I think when we say domestic violence, yeah, I want let's, us to let's, yeah, let's define let's, it. Let's define domestic violence. I think a lot of us talk about domestic violence, we automatically jump to black and blue marks, and we're only talking about physical violence. That's okay. what I thought yeah, of until course, you just Right? Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, so like we're always thinking about like pushing, shoving, choking, beating all that. Up, yeah. Beating up. Like law and order SVU type. Exactly. Okay. And, I, and that does exist. It does exist, and it does exist in our communities. Um, but really, the larger definition, both in like the literature out there and how we define it as service practitioners is really looking at a pattern of behavior. So we're looking at a pattern of one person in a relation trying to obtain and maintain power control over the other one and instilling fear. And it's not done only by physical violence. It's done by a whole whole host of different types of abuse. And we call, I think about it as like the toolkit of the abuser or the so like it, it doesn't jump from very rare. Do you have someone who just all of a sudden is beating someone up? And I, I, I don't like saying he is the abuser and her is the victim because or survivor because we serve everybody and anybody could be a victim. So but I might fall into that a bit. But I want to say that up front because we do know that there are men who are survivor victims of of abuse and there are women who are perpetrators. So really, yes, that's news to me. Yes. I um, 17 percent of our calls most recently in this year have been from men. Really? Yeah. So 17 or 70? 17, 17 okay. percent, which is higher than I'd say the national call rate for men, but mm -hmm. we certainly get male callers. Um, so we're going to take a step back. We're saying it's a pattern of behaviors and still fear. So it could be anything from emotional, verbal, psychological abuse, ways of making the person feel crazy, name calling, um, de demeaning the person to using technology to abuse. And I want you to just think about it for a second. I know we all have young kids, but we all like it, it's great when you have a teenager and the phone has a tracker on it. Right. We want to know where the person is. Yeah. But think about if someone's trying to control you and they're able to stalk you that way or That's using, scary. right? Think about how technology is used now um, hmm. to control someone or using social media to control someone or WhatsApp groups. It's like manipulation. Yeah. Right, man exactly. Manipulation or like like ways of shaming someone online. So there's, there's technology abuse, there's financial abuse, and we're not talking about a budget, which probably most of us should have. We're talking about like how putting other person on allowance and not letting the other person have access to money. So we'll see that as not allowing the partner your spouse to have a job or if they're at their job um, 
you know, tracking them there, making sure they're there. If they they have a paycheck going into an account they have no access to, and it's, it's not so a, scary. it's very scary, and it's not about having a conversation about it. Like, okay, you're better at finances, I'm better at chinuch. Like, we'll split it. It's mm-hmm. about like you don't have a voice, and so I I think about um, and then there's you know there's all these other ways that someone has control. So like isolation, like not allowing that person to have a relationship with their family, or court telling it, or telling that person that their friends are no good for them and it slowly becomes that they're so isolated. And if we think about COVID, so like a year ago, we were all kind of isolated, I would say, and like how difficult it is and how cut off we felt from our resources. So if you're in a relationship and you're not, you aren't allowed or, or you feel you're controlled, you can't have your resources, like how do you get help? So there are all these different ways um, the person can control someone. So we have financial, financial, we're talking about emotional, verbal, um, sexual abuse happens within relationships. Um, there needs to be consent in relationships and how that's done. Um, and then there's spiritual abuse, which is something that we talk about a mm-hmm. lot, um, which is really talked about in faith-based communities. So we work in the from community and how is the use of halacha and how is the use of our community and how is the use of, you know, any of our rituals and practice used What's to What's an contr- example, example of spiritual abuse? A spiritual abuse. So first of all, using like using text in Pesukim to say that you're the man of the house and you have no, you know, ish shera, you know, like you have to listen to me. Um, but also not allowing the person to to um, practice mitzvot, right? So they, let's say, um, you know, I had this client I worked with for years and she wasn't allowed to go grocery shopping and there was money in the house. It wasn't an issue of budget. She was, she was he, he had to do all the grocery shopping. And so that's like financial and very isolating, but he had this tendency to every Friday show up with all the raw materials or groceries right before lich benching, mm. right? So she would be forced to cook on Shabbat, right? Oh so gosh. she was being Michal Shabbos. And and not only like, but but if she wouldn't, she felt like she was like, her kids wouldn't have a Shabbos and she was trying to figure that out. And like, and it, and so it would be so demeaning to her because she was just this from lady who doesn't want to, she doesn't want to be Michal Shabbos. Or let's say this idea of, um, in a lot of communities, I mean, this is interesting, a lot of the Hasidic communities, young couples in the first year will eat at their parents' houses most mm-hmm. th- most nights, not only Shabbos, most nights. They're really still, Did not inter- know that. yeah, it's really interesting. They're really still integrated. Often they're very young um, and they're still, and they might not know each other well. And it's a really a way of supporting a couple. Like it could be a really a beautiful practice. Like it's a cultural practice mm-hmm. and it's beautiful. But then let's say he doesn't let you, right? So and it's, it's not exactly spiritual, but it's like a cultural thing. Like you're not doing something that's expected of you. And then all of a sudden, and like, but you're not going to tell your mom you're not, you know, that you're not doing it because your husband's not letting you. So it, it cuts you off from your family, right? You're not part of like your family in the same way. And then it's like so choking. It's like imprisonment. I love how you said that. Yes, that's what it is. It's I'm just like, thinking about thinking like about that scenario, that situation. It's so. It's like I don't want to say I don't want to say it's worse than physical abuse, but it's that's like really bad so so nothing you're like on it because when you when i used to run like clinical groups to the women they would talk about the non-physical abuse as more painful than the physical abuse because physical abuse is very um it's almost like everybody accepts that it's wrong and also like it's tangible like i'm not crazy i know it happened Mm. but when there's these other kind of insidious subtle abuses where you're kind of like am i losing my mind right like is this really happening or how do i explain to someone why i'm feeling so isolated or i feel so afraid when it's non-physical right even though there's typically an overt or covert threat of physical abuse like they might not be said but you're you kind of know it could happen um so Often, like it is, like people, I've been in groups where we're survivors, we call them survivors, even when they're still in it. Um, the survivors will say things like, I just, w- you know, I wish just wa- wish it was black and black and blue, right? Almost like the black and white would be better. Like it makes much more sense to me if he would just do it already or she would right. just do it already. And then like everybody would get it. I could go to my mother and say, this is dangerous. This is what happened. You know, I could go talk to my Rav where when you're saying, oh, he's calling me names, you know. It's calling names, you know, it's not something any of us should do in relationships, but people misbehave in relationships, like, mm. you know, so. The, the, uh, <laughs> I, I love how you explain the spiritual abuse one. I certainly didn't know much about that, but like, that's sick. <laughs> it's interesting like, what only touches that people. One. No, 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 it's no, interesting. The ones are fine. I'm just quoting it. So not according no, to that. <laughs> that one's fine. Yaakov, not this episode. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, but no, because like, you're not just, 
you're turning up you're turning someone against God right and it gets in the way like your relationship sure, but I'm sure it goes the other way as well also oh, yes. like someone forcing to halakha strict, down right. yeah down right, like right. being a and then how or, do you make that distinction right like there's certainly in a relationship and those of us who have been blessed to be in relationships know there's negotiation right we might yeah. feel different about certain halachos or anything in our lives right even mm-hmm. about budgets anything you could think about so when when is there negotiation and when does it feel controlling right and then and that's when we do uh, we kind of talk it through like is do you have voice like if he thinks or she thinks I should be, you know, mocked on this and I don't really want to, but can I say something about it? Do I do it because it's part of the relationship and I'm going ahead with it, but I, I'm okay with doing it because it's part of the relationship or do I feel forced and I'm afraid to say this doesn't feel so, so comfortable to me. Line? So we look at patterns, right? So, so, you know, I was talking to a colleague and I'm like everybody in their relationships, I think it's say you have a fight, they fight, right? We yeah. have to learn that about marriage. Like people fight, right? That's, well done. I just want to get that Everybody clear from fights you. in their marriage. That's normal. <laughs> it's okay. normal to fight in a marriage. Now, if you're ducking and you're afraid, that's different. Mm-hmm. If it's a pattern and you feel demeaned, if you feel controlled, you know, so, you know, there's the part and, you know, about just like learning about relationships that have healthy fights and fights that, that are, you know, are okay and move you to- towards something and they're not scary. So, but... So we look at the patterns, like, is there more than one thing going on? Is it happening often? Now, if there's a physical incident, uh, like, that's domestic, you know, like, it's very, yeah. very clear. But when there's all these other things, are we looking at how they move together? What is it? What does it feel like? What is the experience? And when you speak to someone who's experienced it, even when there's no physical violence, so we go to the prevalence thing, it may not be physical violence. Um, they'll be able to describe to you that they feel controlled. They feel that they don't have power. Um, I use the language voice. They feel like they can't. They, they can't say something back. You know, they can't say what they need. And if they do, they're frail, fearful. So maybe they will say something back, but they do it with what fear. Are they, what are they fearful of? Usually, physical violence, even yeah. if it never happened. I have a question. Are, or sexual assault, either one. This is very bad. Uh, um, are these? <laughs> that's really bad. Yeah. Okay, yeah, sorry, that's, that's the only one that's, that's bad. Really bad. No, no. The whole <laughs> statement of them being scared yeah, is very bad. Very scary. So, yeah. uh, do these? abusers do they look like like the devil emoji or <laughs> and or like are they like oh they're clearly a bad guy or a bad girl or do, like they're not really and sometimes like Maybe they don't even realize. Could they be your so, I, you know, could, I've gotten yeah. this question a few times. So like, okay, so both abusers and the one that's being abused or the person that hurts and the person that's being hurt um, look like any of us. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mamash? And that's what we know. Anyone. You, I mean, I'm not into like being like, oh, it's been sensational. But like, let me tell you, I've treated, you know, the wives of doctors, the wives of, you know, of rabbis, like, you know, wow. like, like, you know, principals, husbands, like it could be anyone in our community because people have very different personalities and, and inside and outside their homes. And I, I can't say that's not true all of us in the sense of like maybe more relaxed in our home mm-hmm. but that's very different than being abusive um so it could be just about anyone do they not know about their behaviors um well if you let's say you you're not great you, you make a mistake in your relationship you're not particularly polite to your wife or my husband or whatever it is and then you apologize and you feel responsible for that behavior that's a different that's a different mo than someone who when said that doesn't feel right right if you're in a relationship and it doesn't feel right and the person i don't know what you're talking about or belittles it or says it's your fault if you would have x y and z i wouldn't have done it so those are very different um experiences right so um there's a, there's there's it's important to distinguish between like healthy or i call it healthy enough relationships like high conflict relationships and abusive relationships and those are very different um and their experience is very different now that being said if someone's in a high conflict relationship they're unhappy or they're in a healthy enough relationship they're unhappy people should get help for it like you don't have to be abused to get help you should get help you should get support um but um there is there is a real difference and it feels very different um and the pattern is different um i often think about it um so here, I'm going to age myself yet again, as after the September 11th, um, I just moved to New York. I could before. even say September. I, okay, I, I, <laughs> okay fine. Yourself. You remember that. I'm no, but, but, but like, you know, I moved to New York right before then. And I remember I was living in Manhattan and like the feeling of just like nothing feels safe. And, the, and right. our, you know, and if you lived in Eretz Israel after, you know, Pigou and, 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 and during after an incident, that feeling that. It just doesn't feel settled. So I always think about like, you know, being on red alert, orange or your alert and yellow alert. And in homes that are fraught with family violence, interpersonal violence, um, that's the experience where there's like this, there's the threat of something that happen. It could be many years or many months when there's another incident, but there's an awareness that there's a vulnerability. And that's different than being in a, a healthy, healthy enough relationship where you fight sometimes or you have conflict and you need to work things out and you need to go see someone either separately or together to figure that out. Um, and that should be encouraged. But this is a very different climate. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and and it's important to recognize that. Um, and I'd say if that's the climate, we don't encourage couples counseling, and that's an important takeaway. If that's what's going on, and um, there's fear, it's it's not it's counterindicated to go for therapy together. You're saying the therapist won't won't therapist pick it up. Should not be picking up cases if there's active domestic violence together because it's it's not safe. Right? No, I'm asking like, will the therapist even I realize? Think most, I think, I mean, it matters what's being said. Listen, what happens in a 50 minute session is right. what, you, yeah. what you're, you know. Um, so I, I, I hope, you know, they're, they're, they have the ability to to. to hmm. Would you that. be able to, you know, I don't know if it's possible, but would you be able to describe what a healthy marriage, a high conflict marriage and a, an abusive marriage looks like? I have like? to like really, I have to write an article about it because I think it's really important. Um, Lisa Tversky writes a really great book about it. Like, Am I Being Abused? I think it's called and I highly recommend it. Um, Guys, you don't want to see your wife reading that. <laughs> no, but not. you do. And so, well, I guess not, but I think any, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I think, okay, but let's go. Like, I think the more all of us read about it and the more all of us right, talk about it, right? About then it. then when we see it and or a friend, see, a friend is experiencing it or someone in our lives is experiencing it, it isn't as shocking and we're able to respond with support so yes i guess you you know it might feel jarring to see that but it's an excellent book in the way of like let's be real about relationships so like you know one thing she talks about is like people could have some very significant mental health um, challenges and some of the behaviors might look like abuse and and how do we distinguish between those and then treat those Mm -hmm. you know and then people can make whatever choices they want about maintaining staying staying in another relationship you know um so the best way of i think about it is really about a healthier I call healthy enough relationship is that there's some level of equal power it doesn't mean that we have everything is egalitarian and but there's some level of of like power shared and it's I don't know if you think about like like we make decisions together or we each take something we're better at to make decisions but there's discussion about it but if I'm interested in knowing I'm I, in many ways I'm very traditional in my marriage I'll be clear and I'll be sure that and I'm not great at finances I could I don't, I can handle our checkbook, but like, I don't do our other stuff. And my husband's really much better at it. So I kind of just say, okay, you take care of that. I take care of all educational choices, all the other stuff, you know, but, but if I'm interested in what's going on and sometimes I am, I have access to it. Right. It's just, Hey, what's going on. Right. So there isn't a sense of like being disempowered and in a high conflict, there might be fighting about that. Right. There might be like, well, you let me do this. da da. And then when you're walking, going into abusive, like you'd have no right to have access to this. Right. You don't have, you you don't have any right. Like this is mine um and you know and i have power over this and you might not even be feel comfortable asking because you know you feel so disempowered so if you look at different realms of your life right um then then you're going to be able to see that right so with finances i think that's like one of the easiest ones because it, it is very tangible in many ways but your emotional life like whose needs are being prioritized Right. And sometimes it's mine and sometimes it's his because that's normal life. But do we both get opportunity for, for our needs and, and dreams and, you know, wants and interests being recognized? Um, and or is there a lot of conflict about how that's done? It, or is one person never, ever being recognized for that and being able to to express that? So it's looking at those patterns. Um, obviously, in the field that I work, we do a lot of work around just looking for like actual risk for fatality or injury, you know, so it does sometimes come down to just looking and there's scales that we do to look at, are you really at risk for, God forbid, chas shalom, actual injury? I mean, that's a very different, but so we get to the prevalence question. Let's go back to that. Yeah. So we don't really know. Okay, so the research out there is, I believe, I didn't bring any notes um, anymore. I think it's one in three or one in four women experience some level of intimate partner violence. That's what it's called in literature. And um, one in every six men. Okay, so the research, you know, as kind of a research nerd, is not well um, gathered. It's very hard. It's a very underreported phenomenon. And, um, you know, what does that really mean? We do know that it happens a lot. And then there is basically very little research in the Jewish community. There was one piece of literature out of Chicago around 10 years ago that had almost the same statistics for the Jewish community there. There's actually something coming out in the end of April um, that we're involved in about qualitative research. It's not numbers, but just kind of describes the phenomenon. But there isn't great research. But we know it happens too much. I mean, that's like it happens. It happens more than any of us really fathom. Um, You know, we've gotten 27,000 calls in the last 23 years. Wow. 
27,000 calls. So, well, 27,000 Could you calls. play out like an yeah. example of a call and like how sure. it sounds? So let me, can I, can I review? So, so Shell and Task Force has three main services. So one of them, which I think most people have heard about and I hope they've heard about is our hotline. And mm -hmm. our hotline is now also a chat line, WhatsApp line. So it's really accessible oh, to people. Really? And so people should know that if you call, first of all, it's completely anonymous. You don't have to share anything about yourself. Um, we don't have caller ID on on the hotline, so you really are confidential and anonymous. So, and it's a place just to to be heard and believed. And I think it's important to be said because what we do find is that many ways we're the front line um, to the community, where people call and they'll literally say, "This is the first time I've said this out loud." Hmm. Right. So that's a very typical call where it's someone will say, this is the first time I'm saying this loud. Is is this is this safe? Is this will you tell anybody? No, we can't. You know, and it's really a place to just be validated. That's a 20, is that a 24? No, we're not able to do 24. Eventually, I, I hope to. I have all these ideas, but um, it's six days a week. I, the numbers are all on the website, but, you know, from nine to 10 p.m., um, okay. mm -hmm. you know, um, so. But it's really a place where people will say, like, you know, this is what's going on in my marriage. And people will describe things. You know, those guys, I'm on, you know, and usually the first question is, well, what brought you to call today? You know, are you, well, first, are you safe to talk right now? Because, you know, we want to make sure people are safe. That's our, always our concern. They're not in listening ear of the person who's hurting them, that, you know, they're not being recorded in any way. And then they'll say, you know, is this a safe time to talk? And then what's, what brought you here today? What, what, you know, like what? And often there'll be some incident that happened, either physically, you know, and during COVID, we've heard a lot more physical incidences. Or just like something doesn't feel right. Like I'm just like something's not right in my marriage. Something's not right with the person I just started dating. Like I just want to talk to someone about it. And then people will describe what's going on. And what we see our job is to believe them and validate them. And then if they want to work on something we call a safety plan, if that makes sense, we'll do that with them on the phone. Like, okay, you're not feeling safe right now. What are things that can make you feel safer and make you be safer? You know, do you need to, you know, and we'll go through like, how do you physically stay safe? How do you emotionally stay safe? And then, you know, we are not a direct service provider. We don't have therapists on staff. Um, we're very clear about our role. We have relationship with hundreds of agencies across the country and now more because WhatsApp has opened us up to working with communities and you know I'm speaking in London soon Australia South Africa Israel because wow. of the WhatsApp world um, and so we have relationship with with people who do this work all over and then we'll help them get there so when so you, you refer we refer out for that to, to therapists to therapists so you a hope lot of to social one they have in-house or you know and, you know we talk about that um you know, other people do fabulous work and we're not here to replicate it. Right. So um, I would like us to do a little bit more follow up if we could have, you know, honestly, if we had the funding to have more social workers to call people back. But honestly, we have such wonderful colleagues out there that we serve a very particular role. Like we're really the listening ear. Um, we're the voice for this issue. We do a lot of work nationally to make sure people know it exists. But do we need to replicate other people's services? Right now, it's not. We have other. You, you said there's two. You said there's three, three things. Three services. Okay, so, so our third. I got one. And yeah. I, you know, so that's what it, so if anyone's thinking about calling to know that they're not going to be forced and we never tell people you have to leave. Like we're very just like listening and reflective and. And, um, and then our second service is we actually have attorneys. So that's where we do something. Um, we do meet with our clients and we have attorneys primarily in New York City um, who go to, if people want to, they they go to court with them and they help them through the process. And But they also do a lot of consultations. So people are like, I don't feel safe. I don't know what's available to me. I don't know what that would look like. And they consult and they just learn about the process. And again, people do it at their own timeline, but we'll walk them through both the divorce process or other safety mechanisms available and the based in process. So, you know, we work with based in all the time um, and it's up to the particular client what system they want to work in and then we'll work with them. So we work with Rabunim um, to make sure people are getting the get in a in a way that's um, um, appropriate, um, and that they're they're things are resolved for them in a safe way. And our third service is really education, which in many ways is the most exciting service because we go into schools, shoals, community mental My health. Shiva did this. Yeah, which is My Shiva. Shiva, it's Shiva Nishmas Torah. I remember Beautiful. we had someone. Um, this is before I started dating, but they showed videos and they described, you know just healthy communication in, in, in relationships. And yeah, I thought it was re really incredible. You sort of like, cause I feel like someone can get into relationships and get married and not know what's, that's not acceptable. Right. I think that's, you know, and we don't have language for it. And because right. like in a beautiful way, our community is so tznius, right. And like right. marriage is so sanctified and it should be that we don't really talk about it. So when you right. have your first argument, um, you're kind of like, what was that? And, and unless your parents had like, 
really communicated a ton of to you about it. Like, where's your template for that? So we do a lot of that work. Actually, this is a Keepa we did with some of the some of the schools that we we're doing. Um, you know, Go Purple Keepa, where we we're actually this past year did this whole new program with 11th graders throughout the country, 23 different schools, 7,000 kids participated. Wow. And purple is the move. purple is the color of domestic violence awareness. And boys and girls, um, you know, separate, but um, to talk about domestic violence so that people have the language. So even though you know, 11th grade, are you really thinking about this? I mean, but but we don't talk about only dating relationships. We talk about like healthy markers for relationships, right? So, you know, um, even in friendships, like jealousy, possessiveness, those aren't, you know, we're looking for people who are, you know, kind and honest. So we do a lot of that. And it always gives us a lot of um, nachas when we get a phone call on the hotline from someone who heard one of these programs in 12th grade in their senior year or in their seminary year. Mm. And they say, you know, we teach about people, we teach red flags and trusting yourself and something doesn't feel right to ask about it. And then they call and they're like, I just started dating someone and X, Y, and Z just happened. I just want to talk about it. Right. And then we'd much rather people explore that and be curious when they're dating or, you know, then, you know, when we, when many years later, when unfortunately, you know, they might, might be victims. So. What would your advice be to someone if they're dating someone and they, they start to think and mm-hmm. they call the hotline and like the person might have these abusive patterns, like right. is like they should dissociate with so, them? And like- so that's why I don't jump. Like, I think we have to be very careful. Right. So my language is always like, be curious. If something doesn't feel right, just don't like ignore it. I remember so much that I had a client that I worked with. She was married for many, many years. And we were talking at one of our sessions. And I said, well, what did you see when you're dating? Like, tell me more about it. And she goes, you know, I f- something felt wrong. And I said, well, describe it. And she goes, it was my birthday. And we were engaged. And he he bought me a boom box. You guys know what a boom box is? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I said this is the one reason like, what's that? <laughs> so um he bought me a boom box and I don't It's like care. a fax machine. I, exactly. Okay. Right. He goes, she goes, I don't I don't like music. And I had told him I didn't really want one, but he wanted one for our apartment. So he bought something that mattered to him. And he didn't think about anything that mattered to me. That's very subtle. And she goes, I remember sitting there going, this doesn't feel good at all. But she's like, I ignored it. I was like 24. I felt like I had to get married, which is pretty young. But I guess at the time felt like she was like, put it away. And like, that was his behavior. He didn't care about me. And that escalated to actually a very physically violent relationship. Well, it's really, you know, the lines can get really yes. blurry in the beginning because that could just seem as, OK, the guy is out to lunch. I've right. definitely gotten my wife a gift that I'm like, uh, I will enjoy it right. more. More. But but so then so then I said so so what is it? It was a picture frame. It was like it was like one of these like portal from <laughs> Facebook. It was a picture <laughs> frame. The running I'm like, you would love it. She does love it, but I definitely <laughs> Okay, yeah, but so so, so okay, so then the question is what should she have done? Do you just break an engagement because of that? No, you don't bring in mm-hmm. but do you get curious? Like if something feels bad, mm-hmm. right? If we could be in touch with our feelings about a relationship, then I say be curious. So figure out what what would you do? Talk to someone. Call in, in the relationship though. Should one should be able to talk to their partner and yeah, say like, yeah. hey, let's talk about like how I felt. Right. And how if to, they can't, then that's right. An and then issue. that's already like feel. And right. it's hard to, especially right. in communities that might date for a much shorter period of time. But who do you have in your life? Right. Is it a therapist? Is it a mashpia? Is it a rav? Is it a rebbitzin? Is it? Mm-hmm. Does your college? We do a lot of work with college teachers, not to be therapists, but to like notice these things, mm-hmm. right? And then refer. But like, be curious if it doesn't feel right? Don't ignore it. You know, and it may be nothing. It may be he was out to lunch or that his roommate thought that'd be a really fun gift or, you know, right. he was clueless. I mean, there's, a, we all, we all are clueless, but like at times, but like be curious about it. So that's really my answer to sometimes that. Sometimes also men, like the difference of genders, mm-hmm. sometimes like you grow up as a guy, it's <laughs> completely different as yes. growing up as a girl. Yes. And, and, you know, it's just like guys can think one way and a girl will be like, are you serious? And be like, what? Like that's just, but, but she was able to say, "Are you serious?" Exactly. Right. So right. she was safe enough to say that in a relationship like this. You don't feel comfortable doing that. Um. So it just to me is just like explore it more. Don't don't ju- jump to anything. You don't have to decide right now. Right. Like slow down. Figure out what's going on and see if you're comfortable. And it doesn't mean it's foolproof either. You know. You know. It's not domestic violence happens in the secular world at probably probably a more of a rate. I, mean, I don't know. And they, a lot of those people knew each other for much longer times than we, any of us did, the people we married, and they still have it. So you can't always know, but like, slow down, think about it, get, get, get support. Um, and, and uh, be curious, like, don't, don't ignore things. We'll be right back to that episode with Dr. Shana. But first, we need to tell you all about something that's magical. AMR Pharmacy. Boom. Best pharmacy in the world, like you heard us say, 
I feel like I've been saying that a lot lately. That's the best pharmacy in the world. Do you, do you, are you like me that like even outside of the podcast, I'm just referring AMR to people when they're like, yes, yeah, so when I'm referring to something that's the best in the world of like, this is the best pizza in the world. They say that this is like AMR, AMR. <laughs> like, this pizza is like so AMR. So let's play it out. You're like you're by a pizza store and like, oh, someone's like, wow, these fries are amazing. I'm like, like, yeah, that's AMR. Yeah. <laughs> which, which really means that's great. So you're, you're like verbing the word AMR. Like yeah. AMR is now like, not verbing, well, adjectiving. adjectiving. Actually, adjectiving. Yeah, we just, we, we just verb the word adjective. Yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. AMR Pharmacy is the best pharmacy in the world. So give them a call at 848-222-1110 or visit amrpharmrx.com. They're not just, hold on. We, we're just saying it and it's like, okay, they're ama- We're not just saying it, everyone. They really are amazing. Or how about this? Prove us wrong. Give them a call. <laughs> Ciao. Do you, I, I'm, I always like stories. Yeah. Do you have, I'm sure you have a lot. Like, is there a story that you would want to share from Sheldon Task Force? It could be, it could be anything. I, it could be a wild story, a, a happy story, um, an interesting story. Um, yeah, I mean, I could, I, let, let me think for a second. But I think what, um, I, I like to always talk about this in a hopeful way because, um, you know, there's a lot of stories and you, a lot of people in my field, we could talk about some of the horrors we, we witness with our, with the people we have the privilege to serve, quite honestly. You know, we, we see people in very, very hard times. Um, but there's, there's always hope. And I think it's something we should always know that there's support and there's hope. And as a community, we need, we need to talk about it so people know that. Because uh, if they don't, if we don't talk about it, they don't know. You know, they might hear Shalom Task Force, they'll see something of an ad, and the da, 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 and then, you know, that that um, we we had someone recently call like a year ago, and she, we asked what brought her to us, and she said, four years ago I cut out the little ad on, in one of the newspapers, like a little ad, and I I I folded it like many times and put it in a very safe part of my 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 wallet, and I finally just I had the courage this morning to call and. And she wanted to think about in long term, how can she be safer? And I was like, okay, so, you know, we plant those seeds that were there. But if we don't talk about it, if, we're, if it's not in our, you know, we, we don't do it. So so I think about like hope and how things can get better. So I, I think about a woman I served, I, I worked with probably like 12 years ago. And and it was an interesting experience. She, she got married in her late 20s um, from... Um, in a community where that was a little bit older and she really liked the guy a lot and you know he was a little bit more domineering but like nothing unusual but but one of the things that she would do she worked in the city um, and every they lived in Queens and every morning he insisted they have breakfast together but like a long drawn out breakfast which is romantic right and very sweet but if you have to get to work you're always late yeah right I don't think New Yorkers know what breakfast right. is <laughs> right and those no, who are listening I, had, from I, I know I had breakfast you like had three, breakfast years today? Ago. Yeah, three years ago <laughs> yeah. so no but like think about it. So, so those of us <laughs> those of you who are not listening from New York like from get to Queens to Manhattan is a good 45 minutes on the subway and mm. and she she was always late to work because of it. And it got later and later. And she she would say to him, like, I can't do this every morning. Like, but he would he would put into this thing, but I love you and I want to spend time with you. And and it was really uh, making it hard for her to work. And then he would call the office all the time. So it was an interesting, you know, form of fi- financial abuse where she basically lost her job because of his behavior. Mm. She was always late and he kept on calling at work and she and didn't get work done. Job, but... And he worked, but he okay. had more flexibility. And it was one way of her becoming very dependent on him. And through the relationship, he, she just became more and more dependent on him. And then um, they had a child together and he became physically violent. And she walked out um, with the child, with nothing, wow. with nothing. And um, came to me where I was I was working at the time and I was her therapist and we, we helped get her own attorney and we helped her set her up. So she was on her own. And I worked with her for probably two or three years and, you know, a really strong, wonderful person. Um, and she was doing well. She has a beautiful daughter. She's doing okay. That's crazy, though. Um, a, 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 you know, a guy who you looks on the surface wants to have breakfast and breakfast and breakfast. Boom. But goes, but it wasn't boom. So we were thinking that like it isn't boom because she said I can't do this, and he basically said I don't care what you need to do. Right? It was like the same. But he pattern. wasn't saying those words. He was right. saying he's it like in, I. But right, and that's what we see because nobody. If you're dating and someone's boom, nobody's gonna marry. You know, it's right. very it's there, small is, escalation. Is there, I just want to finish my yeah, hopeful story. story. I need yeah. to finish my hopeful story. So, oh. so let's say eight years. There was more than that. So ten years later, I get a phone call on my voicemail from this woman, and she's like, Shana. Um, please give me a call back. Now, when you're in my field, you get a little nervous when that happens, right? Mm. So I call her back. I'm like, what's wrong? She goes, oh, my daughter got into, and she names two prestigious um, high schools in the neighborhood, and I don't know how to make the decision to where to go. And I almost mm. want to tear. And I'm like, thank you for calling me with beautiful news. Like, right here she is. Like, right. like really, like her daughter has options, and it's 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 okay. You know, it's not, how she, it's not how she envisioned it, yeah. but they're doing well. Yeah. So I like to think about those ones where where, you know, 
it, there are options. People don't have to feel as trapped. You talk like in prison, you know, it, people there, when you're in it, it feels like there's no options. But when you're able to imagine that there's, I'm not telling you, imagine that it could be a different way, then we could, we could open the conversation for people. Um, so it isn't. So let's go back to what you're saying. It isn't like, not, oh, let's have a nice breakfast and a slap. It isn't, right? It's, it's things when you're dating where, where you're being checked on every 10 minutes, right? And where are you? Where are you? Yeah, it's very sweet if your Hassan is calling you. Where are you? But if you just need to put the phone away for two hours to take care of someone and he's angry, he can't get in touch with you, like angry, and you're afraid to put your phone away, right? Then what is that? It's a possessiveness. Now, be curious. Like, is that if you said to him, listen, I need I need some of my own space. Like, I need to be able to take care of school. I'm, And he's like, oh, I didn't realize, you know, I'm a guy, like you said before. Then, okay. And he's like, no, I need to know where you are. Red flag, right? Let's figure out what that is. And then the behaviors escalate, right? Very rarely do we hear of stories of physical violence prior to marriage. Sometimes there's some sexual violence before marriage um, where boundaries are being pushed and people are so shameful um, that these boundaries are being pushed that they don't want to tell anyone, right? Mm. So, you know, we have to figure that out um, because it is, people feel really bad about that um, because of, you know, all the halachos involved. So we just need to think about that. But it never, I, I've never, I've worked with hundreds of survivors. I've never seen it go from zero to physical violence. You, like, you had mentioned in the story, I don't know if it was on purpose, yeah. but you had mentioned that um, this woman had a child and then it, it, it escalated from there. Is, yeah. is, is that like a um, pattern? Is like a certain benchmark where after you have a kid, it could. Yeah. So there is some research, I mean, in the general community that physical violence escalates during pregnancy, the first pregnancy, because in some way you feel more trapped, like, right, like in some way um, that that. And so, yes, I mean, it, you do see some of that, um, that there might be it might escalate when there is more of a sense of like I'm stuck like this is there's more people involved. This is a much bigger decision mm -hmm. um, when when people are don't have children yet, there might be a, it, it's in some way it's simpler. Right. Um, right. No, so, that makes sense. It makes sense. We're talking about relationships and obviously like, you know, in a marriage, it's it's super toxic and terrible when there's an abuser. Yeah. But I imagine this happens in the work wo world also with like, right. and is that, like and people like sometimes that? indicate like, oh, that guy is just a mean guy. Right. Like, no, like sometimes these people are super like manipulative. Right. So I can't and, say I'm an expert on workplace harassment right. and, and, and abuse, but I've done some, I went to one or two trainings on this and the dynamic of power and control exists. Now, mm. certainly it's a bit different, but in some ways, it's the same, right? There's this person who has power over you um, and can manipulate you and make your life very toxic. Now, there are law there. I mean, there's laws for both of them. So I shouldn't say, but like in some way, you feel like it'd be easier to go. But if you're stuck, right? If you need that job, maybe it is. It's it's it could be just as it's not just as, but it could also be very painful and dangerous. Um, but I would like to say that like the men and I, or women who abuse at home are not the ones that are abusing at the office. They may be the same mm. people, but often you'll hear that like, he's such a great guy at the office, uh. right? It's not It's not an anger issue. Mm. It's not like, I mean, some people will be like, I can't say, I can't speak for everybody who's abusive. Like there are probably ones who are angry and dysfunctional everywhere, but there's also the cohort of like the abusive partners who in the outside world function pretty normally you know like they're not angrier or meaner than the rest of us but in their homes they are and i think that's important because when we get stuck you said before like what do they look like when we get stuck thinking they're only the people who are like horrible in the shoal dynamic you know the one guy who's always angry at everybody at shoal like that he might be abusive at home but there might be the really nice guy at shoal also who's right. a, or the nice woman at shoal i would like it's to say so scary. now you're gonna think everybody's it, it, an abuser right <laughs> no but it, it could be a rabbi it, it, it could be your doctor be. it could be it could be i don't only want to use rabbi it could be your it could be right. you know i don't want to like I, it could it could it, and it's not everybody and i think the vast majority of people have healthy enough relationships and try really hard the relationships oh, i'm gonna yeah. be but psychoanalyzing everybody every person absolutely. yeah we don't oh, want to we don't want to get people to you know get nervous and start thinking we do want them to start thinking like yes just but you not know, getting worried not, not paranoid single, and and yeah, like yeah. over well, I mean, if someone's in the, the dating stage right i think that they if should you're dating that's fair yeah. right i think that they should we should you know take a course with us read a good book get someone in your life that like who you trust be it a mental health practitioner because i'm a little biased or anybody who you think has who's like solid and grounded so you could check things out particularly in our community where we date for shorter periods of time where we don't have as much sustained contact you know like and we just need to be aware of that not as a risk but as a limitation to right. to our exposure to each other so if you're in a dating stage yes and if you're in a marriage and this is happening to know it does you're not the only one in our community right you're not the only one in our community experiencing this and the and i feel very strongly 
importantly, that the more we talk about it, everyone talks about it, right? If it becomes like, you know, we talk about um, illness, we talk about, you know, our community does amazing things for people in lots of situations. Like we really live, like it's beautiful. And, you know, and we have Sean Task Force. I mean, we didn't really get into how it started. Um, it's a great story. of How did it get started? What's the started? story? Let's go back. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. No, but like I was not there. But, you know, it started because actually Dr. Lightman from this neighborhood recognized that there were some things going on and, and, and saw some abuse and approached Nahama Wolfson, Mrs. Wolfson, who's a real pioneer. And she said, we need to do something. And she got together a group of like eight women. Um, and I think about it now. I mean, they were raising young children and this is they decided this was important to them and they dedicated their lives at creating an agency. I, some of them are still involved on a day to day basis. What year? What year? 1993. Wow. So that's before, to give context, before the Senate, the Congress passed the Violence Against Women's Act for policy nerds. Like that's when, when we got finally the United States pushed money towards it and it was before the oj simpson trial right before it was a public discussion mm. so like put context like these wow. women were kind of like we it's want foresight right yeah. and they visionaries. were like really amazing and they're like visionaries from women you know many who i'm in touch with weekly if not more who still are involved in the agency who said we need to make sure that um jewish families who need this know that we're here for them and they started a hotline as all volunteers like only volunteers. And wow. I found the budget from back then. It was like nothing, you know, because it was, you know, one coordinator or something. Hmm. Um, now, you know, we're a lot bigger than that. But um, it was, and they said, we're going to learn about this. They weren't from, they didn't have mental health degrees. We're going to learn about this and we're going to be helpful to others. And they they just started taking calls and they started just creating and they got Rev Palm to give a Haskama and they got Rev Bunim involved. And they said, this is real. Um, and and we need an address. We need somewhere for our, our community to go to. And that's what we've been, you know, and I, I, I often sit with the, the women on my board who many of them were the founding board members. And I'm like, you guys, like, just think about what you did, right? Like you you saw a need and you just did it quiet, quietly without fanfare and just made it happen. And you know, now we've served 27,000 callers. Like, it's amazing. You know, like, so that's, you know, and, but the more people know we exist or know that this issue exists and that they're not alone, the more they call and people will say, well, is that good? I'm like, at this point, the more calls we get means that more people are being served. You know, we don't want it to be quiet. I mean, you guys you know? don't, it, it, sometimes maybe someone won't look at it as the more calls, the worse it is, but <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not the more calls, the more people are getting abused, the more calls, the more people are getting help. helped. Isn't that the, the, your line or the line? Like it hurts to call, but it hurts not more not to. Yeah, right? exactly. Is that your, is that that's, that's, that's us. Yeah. I love that. I, I love that. I see how you yeah. guys came up with it. It was like a conversation yeah, like sure. this, yeah. <laughs> you know, no, it's, it's but it's call. true, right? To know that you're not the only one and the more, and you know, one of the things that I think about a lot is like, how do we create community support? Because, you know, from being a therapist with so many um, survivors that will talk about thinking about telling someone or just thinking about what they what their options are and they're afraid they won't be accepted by the community anymore right like what will it be like for me yeah. you know what how do i envision a life that might be different and how do we as a community make sure that we communicate in many ways that like we're still we're still your community you don't have to leave the community to be safe you know that that let's not conflate those issues. Like we want people to stay in the community and feel safe. And you don't have to go into a witness protection, right? You don't need, and you yeah. don't need to leave from kite you, if you choose to. I, I mean, that's not my, you know, but yeah. but you, that's not the choice you're making. Right? The choice you're making is like, how do you get safety? How do we think about safety? And that mean that might mean that you stay in the relationship. I've counseled women who have stayed in the relationships for for decades, and that was their choice. And then we just worked on how do you stay as safe as possible, and that's okay. That's your choice. But but how do we create community where you know, we don't, we don't, so oh, can't be, and we question, you know, we just, we accept, we accept. And if a family looks a little bit different or needs a little different type of support, we do it because we, we accept that this happens everywhere. And we want people to know that there's a place for them here. And that's, that's like what I've really been thinking about a lot lately is like, how do we do that just in so many different ways? Because it's not only about domestic violence, then we accept any types of struggles, right? Like, right. Any, you know, and, and that's, that's the strength of living in our community. Right. Yeah. You know, um, let's let's I guess discuss a little bit that seventeen mm -hmm. percent of, yes. of of men, men that are calling. I, I think people would be shocked by that. Shocked, yeah. Is it is it physical or it's both? It's, it's all both. it's all. So so we don't have great studies on it yet, and we, we want to start pulling what our researchers. It used to be more like eight percent over COVID. The numbers overall have gone up, but the percentage of men have gone up, which has been interesting to us. Some of it may be because we finally were able to open a, a chat line, a WhatsApp line. So I think in many ways, men, more men have been contacting us that way. 
Mm-hmm. It may be more comfortable because, you know, I think that there is, it, 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 you know, not to be like gender rolled and, you know, but I think it's very emasculating for a man to say it's it's hard enough as a woman to say right. this is happening for a man to say um, this is what's happening. It's for, it feels very emasculating. Mm-hmm. And um, and I, I remember speaking to a man once I counseled him and he was describing physical violence in the relationship. And 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 I said, well, and I, and I didn't say why didn't you hit back, but like, what's it like for you? He goes. Shana, I, I can't be a man that hits someone. Like, hmm. like even though I'm physically larger, I, I'm not that type of person. Right. So, and, you know, having that kind of like being grounded in that at the time, but, you know, her being very violent and her, him feeling very controlled by it. So, you know, the numbers out there and there's all these fights in the literature of like, really, do men get abused or what are women really the only victims? You know, I, I you know, again, I, I don't know the answer to that, um, but I believe that men are abused and I believe that we have to be here for anyone who needs help. And, um, you know, that's, that's where we are stands on it. Um, and which is why also when we go into yeshivos and we wish that more yeshivos would have us and based mentorship programs is that we don't go in there saying, don't be an abuser. Like that's right. We go in there talking about, we want all of us to have healthy relationships. Let's talk about healthy relationships. Like you said, your yeshiva, like we didn't go in there saying, assuming men are abusers. Cause we're not assuming that we're right. assuming most people are very, good people who need skills. Um, so, you know, so we're very, we're, you know, we go in there talking in the same, we give the same lecture, basically workshop to men and women. We use different language, we have different right. clips, whatever, but um, with the same message about what are healthy, what are healthy positive markers and what are red flags. Do you um, see, do you see that like when someone abuses someone that the person getting abuse could become an abuser as well? I mean, there is certainly like, you know, sometimes you hear about self-defense. Um, certainly there's always a dynamic. Um, not, I shouldn't say that. There's not a dynamic like, are you saying like uh, eventually to someone else or back and forth? I'm asking on both. Well, <sighs> I don't know. Good questions here. I mean, no, I would say in the vast majority of family <laughs> violence, domestic violence cases, it's really... I've witnessed it one way. I don't want to say everybody, you know, I don't like using language like that. Right. You know, the next question is always to me, well, does that mean, you know, well, what about children who witness it? What happens? Um, Will that mean that their sons will be abusers and their their girls will all be abused? And I I want to say emphatically, no, Mm -hmm. I mean, absolutely not. Certainly, you know, if that's something you witnessed a lot, it, it might be something that, you know, um, your, your social learning theory would say that you might do it more, but, um, I don't think that's true. I think that what needs to happen is people get, need to get healing and trauma therapy so that that they could have healthy relationships. And I'm sure we all know people in our lives who have witnessed very hard childhoods who have beautiful, beautiful families of their own because, you know, they got help and they got healing. And, and so I, I, I often will sit with most of the mothers and they feel terrible that this is what their children have gone through. And it's, it's very sad, but there's also a lot of help, right. you know, and let's just move to that place you, you know where you had mentioned and it's in no way i don't want anyone to think like this was this is not an ad mm. you know for sean task for us we wanted you to speak about this topic in no way it's like uh you know i mean we always yaku and i always ask we never get paid to have on any guests on like that's not what we do if someone's good enough to have on we're gonna have them <laughs> yeah. on and if they it's need to pay honor, then but we, i couldn't i couldn't help but notice that you had mentioned that if you had the funding you would have more mm-hmm. social workers doing follow-up yeah now, for what the is funding, that? we do lots of things. But the follow up part, follow like, up. like you know, we get calls and it's all anonymous. Um, and then we've been trying to do if people choose not to be anonymous, they have to choose, and they want us to follow up with them. Is there a way for us to follow them and do clinical case management? We you know we do a little of it. Um, you know, but the reality is we just don't have a staff like that. We just, um, it's important. So yeah, it is important. And we, you know, we, we rely on many of our colleagues out there to refer them for that. But if, if we were to grow, that's the direction we always think about is not to provide the actual therapy, um, because we're also national. So, you know, are we going to provide the therapy here in New York? Are we going to provide the therapy from the other, you know, hundreds of places that call us? Well, now with Zoom and everything. Right. I mean, there's licensing issues, but we're not going to go there. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't even think about that. But right now, I think that COVID, they're letting it by, but you know, but we do things like we'll go and help other cities with their infrastructure. Like, so we helped Cleveland build their domestic violence program. We gave them clinical training and we're trying to do that more. So other places have the infrastructure. But if we had, you know, if we had more resources, we could, we could do more of that. Do that. children ever call the hotline? 
We get teens and yeah. youth. I mean, um, about about a parent. Um, about a parent or about Friend. relationships in their their lives. I mean, some young people are dating, though people don't talk about it as much. But mm-hmm. um, so it's like the secret place they could call and or WhatsApp into to talk about it. Um, but or they'll call about their families or their or you know we had a few times that like they'll call you about their friend or they were in their friend's house and they saw their friends you know and and I actually uh-huh. believe it's their friend it's not just talking about a friend right. you know um and how do I help my friend through this um so we do get some youth um and you know we we try to help them I think it's brilliant that you're on WhatsApp because it, it's kind of like breaking that barrier because like yeah. making that phone call yes. for some could be very difficult some, some, yeah. like sending a message is is a lot like so it, it's really complicated so our so our hotline is staffed by volunteers our whatsapp is staffed by mental health professionals because oh. it's much um, and i take it some days actually um because it is a lot harder um to communicate like the way we communicate over text you know is People very different notes, I imagine, no right? we're not doing voice notes oh. i know it's also like you know like when you're on the phone, you understand silence, you can communicate here, it's all written. And it's also like, there'll be like big pauses. And we don't know if to interpret that as a person like in trouble now, right. or as a per- person so scary, like, yeah. you know, um, but yes, I think it's really broken down a lot of barriers for people. And we were very particular to get a company that could help us with WhatsApp because they're from community that's like, how we all communicate and, and is it right. still anonymous on whatsapp um so it's 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 less anonymous i'll be honest it's less it's yeah. all confidential and we're all mental health professionals but because of that the company's trying to work with us to you're still you still code. you still you know you still have these laws you're it's you have HIPAA laws you can't really oh yes and we have no we all we it's it changes because of the software i mean very transparent um and we're working with them to make Besides sure it's mark zuckerberg no one else will know <laughs> right um <laughs> he knows Le- I, i'm curious legally Oh, is there lawyer? No, yes. no, no, no. I think you'll know the answer. Is, are there scenarios where, like, has to show them, like, someone may be like in, in danger of their life or they're like, they're. So they, we've been working. You work, yeah. have to call, call like 911. So, right. Like, how so, does that work? So we can't. I mean, this is the crazy really? thing. We don't have the information to do it. If someone calls you and says like I I, I here's my address. Oh, then we would do it if the person oh. asked us to do it. If the person asked us to do it, but like we in the history of Sean Task Force that I understand. I think there was one time that someone said do it for us, but because everything is de-identified, you know, we don't have the information. So when it comes to like reporting to child services, like we're in this position where like we don't even have enough to make reports. Mm. So in some way that's helpful to people because it's the first time they can say it out loud. In some way, you know, we're, we right. don't, we, we want to be able to help and we don't have it. But, um, you know, we have had the situations where we're like, you, it, it sounds like you need either call Hatsala or, or the 911. Do you want to do that another line? I'll stay on with you. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. then we'll be there. Or we've had people who've had the police at the, at the house already. Um, and they're calling us for support during the conversation. Oh, wow. The police are already here, but I, I can't believe I called them. And then we'll just be there for support. But because of how we're set up, um, you know, we're not, we're not able to do all that, which, you know, is in some ways a strength because it's, it feels like a softer way to come forward for people, but it certainly puts us in a situation. I, I have a strong feeling, mm-hmm. unfortunately, that someone listening to this now is in a relationship, abusive somewhat relationship. And I think it's helpful for everyone to hear. Could you talk to that person yes. um, so, directly? Um, yeah. Um, so first I want to say, I'm, I'm going to make the assumption there are, several people or many people who are listening who are in that situation You're and saying one, one in three one in three or one in six hopefully whatever more than eight is. people are listening yeah, yeah. and <laughs> and that's a positive thing because thank you right they have the opportunity to hear this yeah. hopefully in their home or wherever they are that they get safe to hear this and that is an incredible gift you're giving the community because they may not be comfortable going to a shoal to hear a uh, discussion about this where it says Shalom Task Force, but they yeah. can put on this podcast, which they listen to every week anyway. Maybe we should yeah. like, change a title. That, make it, make it, make <laughs> I like, like No, but I want to just think about that, right? Like when we do things like this, we make it accessible. Um, yeah, and that, that was the goal. That was you the know goal. that safe is accessible. So what I say to you um, if you're that you are, not if you're listening, because you are listening, is that you're not alone. You do not deserve this. Nothing you've done makes it you know okay for someone to, um, to treat you that way. And we're here for you. And the Jewish community is here for you and please call us and we're going to be here for you and we'll help you find ways of looking forward and finding safety and that's that's what we're here for um and it's not easy it is not an easy journey but um it's one that we could do together um Wow, that's very nice. Well, what's the, do you know, I, I don't want to grill you. Do you know the number of I Yes, I always have it in front of me because I'm uh, bad at numbers. <laughs> 888-883-2323. And that is that's WhatsApp, number. text, and phone. So and we'll, 888. We'll put that number. Yeah, plug it on. I really, here. I agree with Yaakov where I do think, you know, thank God there are a lot of people who listen to these episodes 
and with this and this one will be no exception and we have like 10 uh sometimes 12 sometimes people 12? listening yeah, yeah, yeah 12 12 people i just came all the way here for 12 yeah. 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 Yeah, hello, but if it's, hold on if it's gonna help then i'm then. kidding yeah. and i have to say i always say to my staff let's say we get 10 people in the room and each one of them and i'll charge everybody like i could i could challenge everybody listening if if every one of you talked to three or four people about it right say i heard this podcast mm-hmm. and i i never knew this really existed and there's someone out there think about how many people we could all collectively just create discussion around like right and that's what we're here for, right? right. So, we're here for so creating, a you know, if we discussion. we call it discourse, you know, if we have that discourse out there, we could shift it, and people we we destigmatize coming forward and getting help in any way that someone needs it, you know, and that's the importance of these conversations. I think it's your middle saying something. I don't remember. Sorry, you don't remember. I don't remember. No. I, I was, you know, <laughs> it's incredible that we're we're at the end of this episode. It's uh-huh. you know, it's it felt like four minutes. It's been yeah, an, almost an hour, and oh. um, I just uh, listen. I. I Thank you so much for for coming here and discussing all this. You really dedicate your life, and it must not be easy because it's you know. Oh, uh, that's a good point. I, I yeah. like where you're, where you're going with oh, this. Oh, thank you. you. Do you? I don't think I don't think he knew where he was going. I don't think I wasn't either. Sure, but <laughs> I don't. But we'll do see. You, we'll see. I'm turning it into a question because uh, if you don't, I'm going to ask it. It's not really a question, but like it, it must be hard for you dealing right. with all the downsides make of that relationships. into a question okay question mark question mark <laughs> is it how hard, do you, how do you is deal it hard with, for you of course it is i mean there, it's painful to watch people in pain but um it's a meaningful life i mean it really mm. you know it's it's meaningful to me and i'll say this to people listening if you have a friend or you're working with someone and you're going through this no it's normal to feel like it's hard and it's normal to get help for it so you know in my life i've gotten helped because i mean in addition for my own life like when you witness hard stuff you need to get support and mm-hmm. you need people in your life who get it and who understand it so if you're you know if you're helping someone else you also need to get support around that and we help people all the time i'd say we get tons of calls from family members and people saying like my friend's going through this how do i be helpful mm-hmm. and i'm so overwhelmed by it so yes it is sometimes very hard um it's interesting now that i'm not as much as a therapist i'm more administrative and like large it's right. it's a little bit of a different role in some way i think i needed that break from being on the front lines as much but mm-hmm. yes, I mean, it can be hard. I feel very blessed to be able to be in the community in this way. Um, I find the work to be very meaningful. Um, but yeah, we all need support around that. We, so. In behalf of myself and the entire community. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I, I wanted to say that, but it feels weird. Like, like, on behalf of the entire community. community. My 26-year-old <laughs> self. I'm like, <laughs> but uh, thank you for your dedication. Yeah, thank you know, because someone needs to do this. And and we thank you for for being that one and and hopefully this episode will will translate into people getting helped. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed that episode. Um, this is one of those episodes that I'm definitely going to re-listen to. Yeah, for sure. There's for so sure. much insightful and helpful information. And what what did you think about now? I thought it was super important. I, something that like we spoke a little bit with Dr. Shauna afterwards is, or maybe during. I don't really remember. My mind gets a little fuzzy, but. More, more schools, more yeshivas need to open their doors to Shalom Task Force to come and let them do their thing and educate people on proper communication. And, you know, I was in yeshiva in a yeshiva called Nishma Satora, and, and they brought in people from Shalom Task Force just to, to just show what, what healthy communication looks like, what manipulation looks like. And they do an incredible job. So yeah, like definitely. And you know what? I, I definitely believe in the you know, yeshiva systems and rabbeim and obviously every yeshiva is different, but I, I definitely in my life, I've seen it. I've, I've definitely had moments where I had my, whether it's my Rebbe or Shiva, it wasn't in this particular field, but they, they gave me advice. They're like, okay, this is now, you need a professional in this area. Like those, the good yeshivas, they, they realize when the situation's out of their MBC, hands. And, MBC MBC the, and, and yeah, and the, and the schools as well. Um, and I just want to reiterate their phone number. There's two numbers here, but they go to the same confidential hotline. I feel like it's, that was an unnecessary word, uh, usage of reiterate. What should the word be? I just want to reiterate their phone number. I just said it was unnecessary. Because she said the number on, on the episode. Reiterate? Okay. Go for I it. I should iterate it? Iterate it. Okay, I'm going to iterate the phone number. You didn't iterate it. <laughs> um, I'm not, I don't remember which one she gave, but they both work. The number is 888-883-2323. Two, three. I'm going to give the other number. It's a little easier to remember, I think. There's a lot of eights in there. Um, the other confidential hotline number is 718-337-3700. We hope you never need to use this phone number. But like they say... If you're not sure, just call. Yeah. And and, and their motto, which I love, that, and, and she said it, is that it hurts to call 
uh, Sean Task Force, but it hurts more not to call. Ciao.